Hi, I'm Andalisi. And I'm Chef James Regato. And in this episode of Essential Cooking, we talk with Warda Bugataya of Warda Patisserie, whose accolades include one of the 10 food and wine best chefs in America in 2022. She was also awarded the James Beard Foundation Award as Outstanding Pastry Chef. And in 2020, she was named the Detroit Free Press Metro Detroit Chevy Dealer's first Chef of the Year. So here's our conversation with Warda. We are honored to have uh, Warda Bugataya in our studio, um, celebrated pastry chef, and with a beautiful facility now, or beautiful uh, storefront, I should say, in Midtown. And we have been looking at your food and eating your food, but we've never talked to you about your food before. I will start out by saying that one of the most beautiful Instagram accounts I follow is yours. Oh, thank you. The, your food looks beautiful and, of course, tastes as beautiful as well. Um, but, Warda, let's talk a little bit about your journey for people who don't know. Um, you had put these desires on the back burner for quite a while as you were gathering a lot of information. And maybe you figured out that those pauses in your life might have been the time when you were learning and preparing for what came next, which is this great success with the work that you're doing now. Can you talk a little bit about your journey? Yeah, absolutely. So I moved to the U.S. in 2004 with my husband uh, for his work. Um, we moved to Sterling Heights, of all places. Uh, How did you end up there? For uh, the, just, uh, the, the work. The work was <laughs> there. Work, exactly, the work <laughs> was there, there. And so we just rented an apartment <laughs> there, and it was the, the, the weirdest place for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that must have been like culture shock. Uh, a huge culture shock. Uh, I remember when I moved in, I was trying to explain to my dad that, that there's no downtown. And he's like, what do you mean there's no downtown? <laughs> I'm like, there isn't. Everything is spread out and you need to, to have a car. And I didn't have a driver's license. And um, um, I only knew how to drive um, like um, uh, a stick shift. Yeah, manual. 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 manual, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so he was in automatic. And so it was like <laughs> everything was a learning process for me. Language was a learning process because my English was like, you know, like a foreign language mm -hmm. learned in high school and middle school. So it's completely right. different from speaking it. Did you have children when you were here? No, no, we didn't have children. Not and yet. we okay. had, yeah, and we had children uh, later mm -hmm. on. And uh, so it was just you and your husband when you got us, here. Just us, exactly, yeah. just us. And um, and so when we had our kids, it was clear for me that I didn't want to. Although I always had this ambition to open uh, a food business with my husband, just because we we love eating, we mm -hmm. we love having people over, uh, and so um, it was just a, a common shared um, passion of ours. But once we had um, our daughters, we decided that for the best, you know, for the best of our family, um, I didn't I wasn't ex interested in back then to open anything physical because mm -hmm. I knew the time and effort that it would take out of our family to do that and right. raise young children. So it was kind of like put in the back burner, but at the same time, always... Always cooking. Always cooking. You would call always. your mom, right? Yes, yes. I would call my mom every day, um, especially when I moved here. Like I knew uh, from a young age how to cook mm -hmm. just because I love eating. And so my mom would teach me and my grandma too. But um, a lot of the dishes, you grew up and you kind of like take them for granted because, you know, you have your mom. She's going to mm -hmm. make them for you. Right. I'll call my mom and be like, you know what, I'm craving some snails. Can you make me some snails? And I'll just come over and I'll have snails. <laughs> but now I good, don't know. <laughs> that's a pretty good way to go. <laughs> <laughs> but now I don't know how to make mm -hmm. a lot of things. And so I was just uh, calling my mom. Back then there was Skype. So oh, yeah, I right, would, yeah. <laughs> you were Skyping back I would Skype my mom, uh, and we would just, like, kind of, like, back and forth share recipes. That's a pretty great, like, experience for you to learn from her. Absolutely. It must have made you feel a little bit um, less homesick um, when you were in this very foreign place. Yes. How long did you live in Sterling Heights? I am kind of curious how long you lasted out there. Uh, we lived in Sterling Heights for three, three years and a half. And then you moved. And then we moved, mm -hmm. yeah. To Detroit? To Farmington. Farmington. Where I live right now. Where you live right now. Yeah. But There's you, a oh. downtown there. You got, There's a, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got, I got I got my downtown. <laughs> <laughs> and that house is a great farmer's market, too. The best. That is a really Very underrated good. farmer's market in, Very in, underrated. in Detroit. Very underrated. Don't tell anyone. Now they're going to know. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were learning, you were cooking, but but 
cooking and baking are yeah. different. Yes. Very different. Yeah. When did the baking part start? The baking part also started with my mom. She's a great baker, uh, and okay. uh, my father has a very sweet tooth. So she was always baking. Always baking. Um, and it was also a way, if you want something from your dad, bake him something. <laughs> <laughs> what did your mom, can you talk about what your mom would bake? Some of your favorite things yes. that she baked for you? Uh, she would make a fabulous um, flan, caramel flan. Mm -hmm. That one is really good. Uh, lemon tart with like the meringue on top. Um, she also makes um, like the traditional Algerian sweets that we have. Some of them are fried. Some of them are baked. Those are also excellent. Um, like sfinge, makarod, um, so many. And then also, what else? Um, yeah. So then your travels took you to other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And you learned French cooking. Yeah. And then you were in Shanghai. Yeah. And so all of these things yep. culminated in Detroit and now yes. the shop that you now run. Yeah. How do all of those things fit together in how you look at what you make and what you create? I feel like my brain is always jumping between these places. Mm -hmm. It was hard for me, like when I started thinking about what kind of business I wanted. For me, it was a natural fit to move towards only Algerian. And that's actually what I was doing back in 2012, 8, 11. At the Ann Arbor Farmers Market, I used to sell only Algerian pastries. And they were great, but they are... But back then, um, it was also hard for only one person to make them. And they're very tedious, very... Like every single pastry you need to make and shape. And, and they're small, and I'm like, there's no way. <laughs> Anyone is going to want to work for me. <laughs> I was having arthritis on my finger. I'm like, no, 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 no. No, mm -hmm. it's not going to work. But um, so when we moved to China, it kind of like opened all these like horizons. Like like Algeria used to be a French colony. So French cooking, especially baking, like mm -hmm. the national bread is a baguette. The national pastry <laughs> is milfeuille. And it's funny because whenever I have Algerians visiting the pastry shop, they would ask for milfeuille, and I'm like, I don't have it. And they'd be like, this is a patisserie, and you don't have a milfeuille. <laughs> so it's hard to explain to them. But, um, yeah, it's for me, it's all these places became home for me. And so I couldn't make, like, only one specific thing. It had to be all of those because all of those places are dear to my heart. How long were you in Shanghai? Three years. Okay. Yeah. And I see, is that where some of your, like, you know, black sesame, some yes. of these, yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's really what sets you apart. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. when I first walked into your shop, I was like, okay, there's there's a story here. I'm like, okay. And, like, I mean, I knew about, obviously, you and a little bit of your story, but your your food tells the story. And that's mm -hmm. obviously, I feel like that's a cliche that people say. Yeah. But really, it's it's true, especially at your shop, to, to walk your shop. And, uh, and, I mean, I have a hard time not getting one of everything there. <laughs> And, you know, we were talking about before we went on air, you know, it's – I think people – they they almost like mislabel it as like a dessert shop. Right. You know, I, I think of you as like a pastry coffee shop. Yes. So in, in – you know, I think in Algeria, Europe, you know, different parts of Europe. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure in parts of Asia, you basically eat a pastry in the morning. Exactly. With your coffee. Yes. And not so much at the end of your meal. No. So in America, we obviously do it a little bit differently, right? We eat – I mean – don't eat sweets. We eat like you know, bacon and eggs in the morning right. or nothing or right. just coffee. Yeah. And then we eat dessert at night. And I think that what I love about your shop is that it feels like a little bit of a, of a, a it's either, it's like it transports me a little bit and it kind of, it's the most European feeling place without, without, you're not trying to create something artificial. It feels so organic there. Well, I'm not trying to like bring Europe to Detroit I'm trying to just translate what feels personal to me and what I want my guests to feel what they walk into the space is that this is our vision. This is what we hope would people will translate with, whether it is people coming from um, Asian backgrounds, um, Middle Eastern, North African, European. I want them all to feel welcome and I want them all to kind of like find um, flavors of what feels like home to them. When I was a kid, I used to joke that I wanted to be uh, work with um, Doctors Without Borders. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't 
that good <laughs> <laughs> in science at school. <laughs> but uh, I, I like to call them pastries without borders. So <laughs> it's that's, my... <laughs> that's pretty, yeah, I, I would say that's pretty, that's pretty accurate for your shop. For it's, anybody that's been there before, that sounds right. It's my um, version of a United Nations. So. <laughs> <laughs> and Anne, I don't think um, non-chef or non-pastry people really realize the limitations of your space. Yes. I mean, she has a very, very small <laughs> kitchen. And one thing that I was uh, that impressed me when I first went there was how intelligent your the compositions are with you know things like the pastry cream and curds and what's baked and what's you know what's kind of like a drop bake like a cookie or what's kind of you know the schedule of your baking program and then the products you have. It's one of those examples of like the limitations actually give you more space because your menu is dictated by the actual concept and the, and the size. And it just – I feel like you've done such a great job of, of using your limitations to you know, really paint to the edge of the canvas. And I just I, – I, I, every time I walk in there, I'm always I'm, – I, I marvel at how intelligent your, your program is. Thank you so much. So what is that process like when you decide – what you're going to make, how much of it you're going to make, how far ahead in that schedule do you know what's coming? It all depends. I feel like the, um, the first thing that speaks to me are the ingredients and the season. Um, I, I fall in love first with the ingredient. And then that kind of like brings what we can do in the capacity that we have. After that, it's mostly what we have in stock, uh, what we need to use because we, <laughs> we don't like to waste the ingredients that we have um, and also what um, works for our team. Do everyone know how to do some, some, some skills or we take that as a way to kind of like teach them and show them new skills. So it could be... It could be something like we have planned, but I'm going to tell you that sometimes we don't plan for anything. I'd be like, you know what? We had some rhubarb from Greg at uh, <laughs> <laughs> from Corktown. So, you know what? Let's make something special this weekend. And so we kind of like just go, honestly, with two grandmas and Anna in the kitchen, we just go to the fridge and be like, you know what? We have this and that and that. And we can do something special this weekend. So that's how we approach it. Sometimes it's also, you know, what can we... Can we reuse? And can we make something uh, special out of what we already have? What time do you start baking every day? 6 a.m. I thought it was going to be earlier. No, that's why we don't <laughs> make bread. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not right. interested. <laughs> we all love sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> but your next your your next day is kind of mapped out, right? Exactly. You walk in at 6 a.m. and there is a map. There is a map timed map right. um, and we kind of like if we if you're new you kind of like look back to that timed um, morning bake that we have but once you get used to it it's it's it just flows naturally yeah we'll be right back right after this black perspectives haven't always been centered in the telling of America's story now we're taking center stage Introducing NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, a collection of Black-led stories from NPR's podcasts. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths wherever you get your podcasts. And so is Detroit the first place you ever did any kind of food business? Yes. You never did pop-ups anywhere? No. You weren't cooking, like, you know, we weren't working in a food business anywhere? I was not interested at all. So this, um, is the, this is the first place you've ever, you know, sold something of food, of cons you sold a consumable for money? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And do you feel like, obviously you were you were brought here because of your husband's work, but how has your relationship with the, doing business in Detroit changed? Because obviously you're, you're here. You want to cook, so you do it. But I'm sure once you open and start interacting with the community, that's really where your business kind of like finds itself. Yes, I'm assuming. Absolutely. How how do you feel? Uh, like, what is your you know perspective of of cooking in Detroit now? It made making friends so much easier, uh, and also the community there, the chef community in Detroit is just the best. If anything, they want you to succeed. Uh, and this is something that I don't know if many cities can can say that or can can do that. So for me, it was just if you know someone, 
Detroit feels like a small village. If you know someone, then you definitely know 10 other people who are just all going to come together and help you and lift you. And that's wonderful. I agree. I feel that same way. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's, especially, you probably, once you know Anthony Lombardo, you probably know everybody. That's, that's basically <laughs> what happens. Totally. <laughs> once you see his Vespa pull up, you're like, okay, <laughs> I, I know everybody now. <laughs> um, you were awarded the James Beard last year. Mm-hmm. Were you surprised? Very surprised. I, we honestly, my family and I went there. My daughters went <laughs> with us. Uh, we went to have fun. Mm-hmm. It was not expected at all. I I didn't go with the expectation of winning. Like for me, to be honest, I thought this was not for me. I thought this was for someone else. It it just felt like, I don't know. It, I wasn't expecting it at all. And there are so many other talented pastry chefs, and some of them were like nominated for the fourth time. I'm like, and I was happy to be first time nominated. Mm-hmm. So I just took it as that's great that I made it this far. No expectation. And when they announced my name, I remember, I can, I don't remember the, that time of like standing up from my chair mm-hmm. and going to the stage. <laughs> it was all like blacked out completely. It's, it's, it's insane. It's wonderful. I think to me, you often, like any award, right? Like the Oscars, the Grammys, mm-hmm. there's right. always... When, somebody wins, you're kind of like, oh, yeah, but it could have been this person or yeah. I liked this movie more. And I don't know if I've ever felt so, like, bullseye. Like, I think I think when you, for me, when you won, I was like, I was like, they got it right. I felt like I, it was like watching a bullseye. It was like, good. Thank you so much. Thank and I'm not you. trying to fan out, but I just, to me, when you see somebody come into a city and do something so well, it's like, that should be so. That's the point, right? I mean, your story... You know, you could you could have a less delicious, impressive product, and the story would still be good. It's like, yeah, you traveled here, you're doing your thing, you're you know representing the cities you've lived in, but to I mean, you don't have to be as good as you. Your your product does not have to be as good as it is. And and, and every time I go there, I'm blown away. So that was one of the that was one of the times that James Beard got it right, Thank and they you. get it right a lot. There's a lot. All the chefs are great, but. I was like, Detroit's been teased for decades. You know, I think the last time we had a winner was like. A lot, you know, decades ago. Yeah. So for for you to get it, it was like, all right, good, I'll take that it. That was really I'll an take exciting it. time. Yeah. It was really, really great. So how, when do you have time to create new things? Do you do that at the store? Do you do that at home, at your shop, or do you do that at home? It's both. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes I do it in my sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I dream. Do you wake up with ideas? <laughs> yes. You do? <laughs> The funny thing is both my husband and I sometimes wake up with ideas and uh, his background is he's a scientist. Mm. So he will like literally like draw them with like shapes <laughs> and like the exact size. And if you bake it, how this is how much it's going to expand. So if you want it to look that way, this is what I would recommend. <laughs> and I'm like, OK. <laughs> but so uh, like, yeah, it's it's both at work Um it's at home. It's with my team. Sometimes we will just be talking in the kitchen and then just be like, oh, my God, yes, let's do that. So we all learn from each other and we all um, uh, inspire each other, So which is great. How about your kids? My kids. Um, so both of them love eating. Uh, yeah. My eldest, Layla, um, she is more picky in that she only wants the best she has expensive taste, which is <laughs> my wallet is not happy about it. But my youngest Kenza, she's uh, she'll be happy with anything. Yeah. But they. But, do, but they, they, do they bake with you? Uh, both of them do bake, mm-hmm. uh, and I try to l- teach them how to bake so they can do it mm-hmm. uh, as soon as possible by themselves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what's next for you? Uh, what's next? Um, the sky is the limit. Um, I don't know. Cookbook maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Um, do you want a second location? I feel like people always ask that. Uh, yeah, um, maybe just so I can expand the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. And I'm sure you have a you have a. I know you have a talented team. Yes. But you also part of retention, and you, I'm sure you want to grow and promote exactly. some of that team. Yes. I mean, we just did mm-hmm. a dinner on Monday for Mamba. Yeah, for Mamba. Which we yep. talk, that dinner came together when we were doing our, mm-hmm. our episode with Mamba here, mm-hmm. and uh, you had you know ordered the, the dessert and it was incredible. Yeah. Your, your, your one of your chefs, uh, yeah, Anna, Anna, yeah, just an incredible talent. 
and yeah, you were you guys. I actually ate. I don't. I don't really do a lot of sweets, sweets at yeah. night, you know. And I ate the whole thing. I literally was like, "Make me one." <laughs> and I, ate, I ate the whole thing. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and, you know, that's part of that's part of growth. I think a lot of people that don't own food businesses don't understand that a lot of times growth is about keeping the talent that you have because you, yeah. need, you know, they they they're not, not don't necessarily outgrow you, but you want to give them a, a, that that piece of ownership or that that empowerment, more money. So growth sometimes is is out of necessity for your team. Exactly, absolutely. But then also, like you, you want to sacrifice. You don't want to sacrifice quality, right? And you don't want to sacrifice also the well being of your team. So it's even if w- with the menu that we have, it's um, sometimes we will do some specials, but then we always kind of like do a check in with the team. How was it? Yeah. Can we improve on this? Right. Was it too much? So ah. it's it's always good to. Check back. Is there any products here in Michigan, like moving here? Like, is there something like produce or resource that you, butter, cream, whatever? Is there something where you were like impressed to find that you didn't expect? Like our fr- blueberries or apples, or was there something where you were like, this is a surprise? Like, was there anything in the produce world? Rhubarb, you mentioned. Rhubarb. Yeah. I will definitely go root food, rhubarb and blueberries because I didn't grow up eating them at all. Uh, we have excellent fruit back home. It's a Mediterranean country, so the food is amazing. But I've never had rhubarb, and it was hard for me to get used to rhubarb because we don't have tartness in our flavor profiles. Mm -hmm. So it took a while for me to appreciate it, but then I also work with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Same thing with blueberries. Uh, It was um, like, how, how do you bake with it? Especially for me, like when I want to control the visual too, that that was like for me a learning process with rhubarb because once you bake it it explodes and I'm like <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah. so but then you learn that you can have different textures and ways of rhubarb in one dessert you can bake it but then you can finish it with fresh ones and mm-hmm. you can you can do so many things the, the your food is beautiful thank you it is and i know that's a Obviously, part of um, your goal is to make it, of course, taste delicious, but it is absolutely beautiful. Was your baking beautiful when you started all of this, or did you get to the point where was that always a consideration or more of a consideration when you started to sell to other people? I think it was always a consideration just because even at home when my mom would cook or when you have guests over, it has to look impeccable. And everything has to look as if you didn't do anything. It came out from the angels. <laughs> and this is what you're going to eat. <laughs> and, and she would go, oh, this is nothing. But I, she worked all day. I feel like I, kn- I, can kn- I know your mom. <laughs> I, I, I feel like she's here right now. She's watching quiet. quiet. I can see like side eye. You probably get oh some side God. eye out of your mom. Always, yeah. always yeah. side eye. You know, she doesn't need to say anything. And she you're like, doesn't ah. say it. Just look at you <laughs> yeah, and you, you know. know if she's happy or if you're in trouble. Yep. There's no in between. Yeah, <laughs> she must be so proud. Very proud. She must be very proud. Just so very proud, proud to see all of your success. Yes. Where, where is she? She's in uh, yeah, in Algeria. Okay, and does she does she visit often? The last time she visited was I would say in 2018. So I haven't wow. opened the shop yet. So she hasn't seen. Oh anything my gosh, yet, we so. have to get her here. She's overdue yes. for a visit. She's overdue, absolutely. She's overdue for a yes. visit. Well, Warda, thank you uh, for spending time with us. Warda Patisserie is at 70 West Alexandrian in Detroit, and I encourage everybody to go in there. You'll be so happy if you do. Yeah, I, I encourage – what I do is I go in in the mornings, usually on weekdays so I don't fight traffic, <laughs> and I get a pastry and a coffee. It is it is both. I think for on the weekdays when you're not ordering dessert at night, come down and get a pastry in the morning. That is my secret tip. Don't fight the crowds. Walk right in. <laughs> I like to come in about 930 and get whatever I want because everything's still in full supply. Mm-hmm. First yeah. thing in the morning. That's the pro tip right there. Yeah, that's, 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 yeah. <laughs> now you know. Thank well, you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for listening to Essential Cooking. If you've been enjoying our show, please drop us a review and share it with a friend. This podcast is produced by me, and Alisi, with my co-host, James Rigato. This episode was also produced, engineered, and edited by Connor Anderson, with production support from David Lyons, original music by the Mallet Brothers. Essential Cooking is a production of WDET, Detroit's NPR station.